Right, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on managing farm related land use conflict, uh, specifically in New South Wales. We have with us today Daryl Quinlivan, the New South Wales Ag Commissioner, and Richard Heath, the Executive Director of the Australian Farm Institute. Um, we won't spend too long on the, on the preliminaries here. Rich is going to do a short presentation on a report that AFI completed, and then Daryl's going to talk about the things that um, come after that report. So without too much further ado, I will hand over to Richard. Thanks, Katie, and thanks everyone for joining in on this webinar. Um, we're really happy to have the opportunity to present the findings of the work that we did um, last year into how to better manage farm-related land use conflicts in New South Wales. Um, so why did we do the study um, in the first place? And, you know, I guess it's uh, no secret really when New South Wales, uh, in New South Wales agriculture uh, occupies about 80% of the state of the land mass that is, is inevitable that at some point there's going to be conflict uh, between that land use and other land uses. Um, and we can all think of the very high profile land conflicts around say the intersection between mining and agriculture. Um, but there's also perennial land use conflict issues that have been going on for decades around urban encroachment, that sort of peri-urban um, type issue. Um, and, you know, to, to this point, uh, there really hasn't been a well understood, well detailed, consistent process to deal with those land use conflicts in a way that tries to minimise uh, the impact and just to reduce the amount of conflict, um, if that is possible. So this study was really designed to look at uh, pathways and frameworks that might be able to make that happen. Um, Katie, are you sharing the screen there? Here we go. So we, uh, what we did um, as part of that, uh, as the study, uh, so just next slide, um, we looked at what was happening um, both globally and domestically in other jurisdictions to see if there was anything that we could learn from the way that land use conflict was being approached um, around the world and in the rest of Australia. Uh, and then we also, you know, really importantly, went out into New South Wales to do some regional case studies. Uh, and we selected four areas in New South Wales that had a range of land use conflicts uh, that, you know, as much as possible, we tried to cover a whole lot of different scenarios and different circumstances of land use conflict. And the four areas that we looked at were the northwest of New South Wales, the Greater Sydney area, uh, the North Coast, and the Greater Humeshire, which is uh, around Albury um, in, in southern New South Wales. So as part of the, the desktop review, uh, we looked at a number of studies and there has been a lot of work done on this, as you could imagine, um, right around the world um, and quite a lot of, of recent work. So I, I won't go into too much detail about those studies. Um, it, it's all in the report and I should mention that the report is available for download from the AFI website if you want uh, to really get into the, the detail of the reports that we've referenced here. Um, just briefly, I'd highlight out of those four that we've mentioned, we do talk about other um, Australian studies as well, but those four being particularly relevant recent studies that have been done. Uh, the first one there, the Goodall paper from uh, 2018, uh, did quite, and that was actually done in conjunction with New South Wales DPI, very extensive surveying of councils to really understand the type and extent of complaints. Um, and that was quite interesting given that it found that between 30 and 50% of the complaints to councils were actually for compliant activities. Um, so they were complaints for things that were actually allowed um, and re really highlighted the issues that there are around communication and understanding what is acceptable practice and what is an allowable practice. Uh, the Ackland paper from 2019, uh, really focused on the Tweed region in northern New South Wales and really around how uh, rapidly changing demographics in, in regions like the Tweed can have a big impact on land use conflict when you have that, that very significant and, and speedy change in, in demographics um, and the land use conflict procedures that there are and planning around land use don't keep up with that demographic change. 
um, that the Cosby and Howard paper from 2019 uh, looked at best practice in land use planning. And that one really noted that uh, how it, there should be much more importance in land use planning mechanisms in recognising the value of the agricultural sector uh, in the way that planning frameworks are built around that. And that currently uh, land use planning frameworks, if anything, actually operate in you know, the reverse to that, in that they actually operate in many cases as a barrier to, uh, to, to productivity and the value of agriculture. Um, and the final paper there, the, the Mortensen paper from 2018, looked at quite specific issues around um, uh, chicken production in, in the urban fringe of Sydney, but sort of more generally around how in managing the sorts of conflicts that arise around that particular um, land use, the understanding uh, of farmers about the importance of social licence and how to communicate what they're doing and maintain the social licence is so important in managing the broader land use conflict issue. So we also in the report just outlined what the actual current legislation is, the policies and frameworks that are in uh, existence. And we do have a look at some of the other uh, similar legislation around the country, in particular the Tasmania's nuisance field um, and right to farm policy. We spent quite a bit of time looking at global uh, frameworks as well. There are uh, quite a lot of countries that have much more uh, developed and, and mature policy frameworks and legislative frameworks around land use conflict and right to farm. And the three particular ones that we looked at was the in the United States, the Delmarva area, which is uh, Delaware, Maryland and Virginia three states that surround the Chesapeake Bay um, and the Chesapeake Bay has a lot of issues with nutrient runoff and pollution and uh, you know it's, it's, it's thought that a lot of that is due to agricultural activity with fertilizer runoff and, and manure and, and so on and it's an interesting uh, case study to look at because the three states take quite different approaches to their right to farm laws and the way that those right to farm laws uh, deal with that sort of practice that is thought to uh, have an impact on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and the differences are that, you know, some of them are, are very prescriptive and penal um, and other states are much more about uh, education and extension to improve farms practice rather than just penalise them for doing the wrong thing. Um, and, and that's an interesting comparison about how effective those, those different uh, approaches are. The, uh, the Green Belt in the, uh, policy in the UK, uh, which is a policy that uh, originally was uh, aimed at providing uh, green belts, as it says, but um, you know, uh, protecting, uh, stopping urban encroachment or urban expansion by uh, legislating for uh, green zones around cities. Now, that wasn't necessarily intended as, a, as a, uh, a right to farm type approach, but essentially that's what it did because it protected those agricultural practices um, around those towns. Now, um, that's another one where it's interesting to look at the impact of that because it has, you know, there's a lot of studies have done about how that's actually had unintended consequences on things like housing affordability um, and, uh, and, and living standards because it has constrained those cities essentially into defined areas and limited the amount of housing and so on. The final one, and, and um, I've actually got another slide on this one following because this is a particularly interesting uh, way that land use conflict is, is dealt with from a policy and legislative point of view is uh, the Ontario's um, normal farm protection policy, normal farm practices protection policy, sorry, um, which is a suite of, of multiple tools that are used to minimise and resolve conflict, um, including what they call a normal farm practices protection board. And, and the reason that we particularly liked the idea of this approach is that it's really successful. Um, it's uh, apparently 97% of complaints are resolved um, through all the processes that exist under this policy um, before they actually get to the, um, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, complaint, the dispute level. They're actually resolved as a complaint before they, they get too far down the track. 
So if we go to the next slide, there's a bit more information um, about that, um, uh, that approach. So it's got a number, um, uh, you know, a number of factors to it. And, and the most important one and the first one is that it is all about communication. It encourages uh, deep and significant communication between parties to resolve conflict um, without legal assistance, without sort of getting to what, the, you know, the legislative opportunity there is at the end. It wants to resolve the, the issue before it gets that far. And it does that through as well as a direct communication if there are um, parties in conflict, much broader community campaigns and community awareness engagement campaigns about um, what farming practices entail. And then if you're moving into a rural community, these are the sorts of things that you're likely to see. And these are acceptable practices. Um, it also talks about unacceptable practices. You know, it's just a much um, uh, broader and, and public campaign about what farming is. If there is a conflict that arises, there is then a conflict resolution process which engages independent experts and, and mediators, um, particularly uh, you know, that, that are, uh, uh, have, a, have a level of expertise relevant to the conflict. Um, so for ex the examples we've got there um, is that, you know, say it's an odour complaint about crop storage, then there'll be an engineer engaged that has particular you know, experience in um, the way that odours travel and, and produced and so on. Um, if uh, all of that fails and that, that conflict isn't um, resolved, then there is finally a, uh, a legislative process uh, where this, the normal farm practices protection board essentially has ruled on what is a normal farming practice. And uh, that then, if you are determined to be conducting a normal farm um, uh, practice, you are protected essentially against nuisance lawsuits that are brought against you. Uh, and that, uh, that Normal Farm Practices Protection Board meets regularly. They're not static practices. It makes the point that practices evolve, that a practice that is okay at the moment might not be okay in five or 10 years as technology changes, as community expectations change. Um, it's all about trying to make sure that the, the best agricultural practices are applied and that the entire community understands what those are and not just the, the farmers that, um, that are actually using those practices. Okay, so next, um, uh, next slide. So then we went and, and explored what the, the issues were in these four case study areas um, in New South Wales. Uh, and the, the reason that we, uh, we picked these areas, as I said at the beginning, quite diverse, although there were a lot of common issues, um, particularly around, you know, almost all of them had issues around intensive animal production, say, like, you know, poultry sheds or piggery sheds. Um, but there were some particular issues relevant to each uh, region as well. So in the Northwest, we've got that tension between the extractive industries and agriculture. So mining and coal seam gas really, uh, characterised by the feeling of the, of the imbalance of power um, in planning processes between big mining companies and, and farmers who are being impacted by the activity of those mining companies. Um, the other issue that was really highlighted in there was uh, and, and, uh, around Tamworth and, and poultry um, uh, farming that goes on around there, but this is one that did actually apply pretty generally was a complicated and limited development application process for intensive animal agriculture expansion. So um, uh, very, very constrained um, uh, definitions and, and compliance procedures that in a lot of cases really limited modern best practice, like new technologies, things that were actually more sustainable that quite potentially would lead to less impact on the environment and the community uh, because they were new uh, and, and not understood by or defined in the process, they were limited through that um, DA process. Greater Hume, um, there was, uh, we, we looked specifically around there on the um, big solar farm developments that are going on down there. There's a, a cluster of very large solar farms that are all quite close to each other. 
uh, and um, they're defined within a state significant development. And there was a lot of concern about the, the proactive planning for that state significant development in terms of what the, the cumulative effect of all those solar farms are gonna be on the community really hadn't been accounted for and really led to a lot of division in the community about um, what the impact was going to be. Uh, and in relation to that, you know, there was just a lack of definitions and clarification in the, uh, in the SEPs about how to define what those, what those issues might be. And again, you know, it's similar to that, that one around the poultry um, example in the Northwest, um, localised complaints on, around uh, animal agriculture and odour, whether it be from drought lots and cattle or uh, piggeries developments and so on. Uh, the North Coast region had uh, um, a lot of specific complaints, the complaints related to intensive plant agriculture and the uh, rapid expansion of the, of the blueberry industry in particular around there. Um, where there was a very common theme around, I mean, we've got miscommunication there, but it, it's miscommunication slash lack of communication, just a um, poor communication uh, between the community and the farming community about what was involved in intensive horticulture and how that was going to impact um, on the community. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's a number of LGAs up there that have quite inconsistent approaches, which again, uh, in, in terms of how those activities were assessed um, against development applications, and that again, you know, with the miscommunication theme caused uh, confusion and, and issues and lack of trust um, from all sides of the community. Greater Sydney, uh, obviously the, the, the issue around there, and it's always been the issue, is about the, the the um, urban encroachment um, and what that causes in terms of nuisance complaints against farming communities as, uh, as suburbs expand and there's more, you know, there's a greater intersection between farming activity uh, and the community. Next slide, please. Now, we, we tried to look for uh, things that were common across uh, the international examples across the uh, various uh, issues across Australia and the way that have been dealt with with legislation and then the, the case studies uh, that we looked at. And there were, there were four contributing factors that no matter what land use conflict you looked at, these four contributing factors were always present, um, some more than others, um, but they were always there. And the first one, and you know, I've, I've mentioned this a number of times already, and it's a pretty obvious one, is the communication issue. Um, and particularly uh, a lack of communication around what is farming practice? You know, what if you are in a rural area, uh, how you get communicated to about what to expect, about, uh, about what a, a normal, acceptable farming practice is. Uh, and then, you know, if that still isn't working, what are the communications channels that are available to actually start to, to, to talk about a conflict, to have that conversation if, if, if either the, the you know, a, a farming business is, is being impacted or communities being impacted by a farming business, where do you even start the, the communication around how you resolve that, how you address that? The second contributing factor was, was education. Um, related to the first one in some ways, but th this is, uh, and, and we want to make it clear here in, in the three dot points that we've got there, is that there is no one part of the community that is poorly educated um, or, or, or um, you know, not as well educated as they could be about the issues around land use conflict. So uh, the community, community more generally could benefit enormously from better education about what farming is. But we have to acknowledge that there are certainly, you know, a number of circumstances where farmers are not doing the right thing and they need better education about how to do the right thing, about what the better practice is, about how they can improve their practice to limit uh, the impact on the on community. And then really importantly, um, education of um, staff that end up being involved 
in conflict resolution. So that staff at local government level, that staff at state government level, that staff at state agency level, um, there are a number of people that end up becoming involved in land use conflict and dispute resolution. And there is a real issue with lack of education of those staff about the issues that they're tasked with resolving. You know, often there's people brought in in a, in a conflict resolution process that have little, if, if any, knowledge about the particular agricultural practice that they're supposed to be um, uh, res resolving a conflict around. Obviously, planning um, is, is a contributing factor um, and there are a number of planning issues and we'll get to some of those in the recommendations, buffer zones um, and uh, lack of guidelines and direction in MDA processes for farmers. Uh, another one that was really consistent and this really leads to a major issue around lack of trust in process is compliance resourcing. So once a planning process is completed, even if it's disputed, even if there are parties that aren't particularly happy with the outcome of the planning process, what inevitably leads to even more conflict and often the most bitter conflict is the way that those planning outcomes are, comply are monitored and, and um, complied with. And the, in many cases, the feeling that, that, that there is just no resourcing put towards compliance against those planning outcomes. Um, and there's, you know, we, we heard all the time about scope creep is the way that, that people talked about it, that they felt that, uh, that there was just, um, that the planning approval was just built on and built on and built on incrementally until it looked nothing like what the original uh, planning approval was because of that lack of, of um, resource for compliance. So what are the implications of all of this? Now, um, we originally started with the idea that we'd be able to quantify the economic impact of this um, reasonably um, easily. Uh, that was actually quite difficult. Um, there are, and, and that's for uh, a number of reasons. Um, this certainly shouldn't be ignored and they're certainly um, significant, but they're very difficult to quantify in that there's no central database for collecting information about conflicts. Um, there's, and there's no baselines for indirect environmental or, or personal um, economic impacts. Um, we, we certainly got uh, anecdotal evidence and, and individual business case study evidence. And you know that ranged in one local government area anywhere between a direct impact of $10,000 on a farming business up to 8 million for a you know, particularly large business. So there's no question that, that there is significant economic uh, impact. Um, and as we say with so much of our work at the AFI, it would be great if there was better data collection around this that it could actually define the issue um, in terms of economic loss, um, a lot more than is possible at the moment. But where there was, unanimous, absolutely unanimous agreement was that while the economic impact is significant, there is actually far more significant impact on those other factors that we list there. The personal impact on mental health, the societal impact on fracturing communities, the, 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 the legal impact and, and the sort of um, you know, whirlpool of legal activity and, and what that, you know, and how that impacts on, on mental health and, and societal issues in terms of that imbalance of power, uh, farmers versus corporates when you start talking about the mining issues, for example. Uh, and then the environmental impact uh, and the feeling that, again, with those bigger state significant developments, that um, feeling that, more than a feeling, that the, the understanding that it's leading to so much loss of ecosystem services that farmers are providing um, as a result of their activities. So the conclusions um, out of all of that, um, you probably got an impression by now that the complexity in this is difficult to overstate. There is no silver bullet in terms of a regulatory process, a single planning outcome, a change in, you know, um, uh, in, in, in planning procedures that would fix this. 
it, it's that that's just never going to happen. There are so many independent interdependencies um, related to land use conflict that require combination of policy planning um, outcomes and options and, and much broader strategic initiatives that are to do with the willingness of government to think differently about the way that they defend agriculture um, in some ways and that they understand farming practice and defend that. Um, that's just a, you know, that's a cultural change, a strategic change to government that can't so easily be defined or contained within a uh, legislative pathway. Um, we did make some recommendations uh, and Daryl might follow up a bit more um, on these when, when he talks. Um, but they were that, so just to run through them quickly, to ensure that um, uh, state significant agricultural land is listed in the new primary production and rural development SEP, which it is a bit of a black hole at the moment. Um, the SEP sort of says that it should be included. There's a spot for it. Um, there's actually nothing in there yet. Um, that biophysical strategic ag land should be addressed in the SEP um, as well. Um, and, and, you know, not just for mining developments, but for all state significant developments um, should reference, you know, there's no point having uh, uh, defining what by um, uh, physical strategic ag land is, unless you do something about it, and that's actually relevant to planning processes. Development assessments must measure the impact on neighbouring and local development, sorry, of neighbouring and local development on existing agricultural operations and the future productivity of B cell and, and S cell. Um, and that sort of, you know, related to, to the next point there, that this can't be a static thing. You know, agriculture changes, the community changes, perceptions change, um, and that, you know, acknowledgement and residential development planning that neighbouring agricultural land use is not static, that, it, that, that in, if that was sort of a more uh, understood process in planning, then the fact that a, a farm might change from an orchard to a dairy, say, uh, would be understood and, and could be thought about in the way that that development is planned. Uh, the next one, this came up all the time, um, Minimum lot sizes is, is a consistent issue, no matter where you go. Um, we're not pretending that that's, it's, it's, it's not a difficult issue. And uh, there are so many considerations on all sides about uh, how you manage that. And particularly from geography to geography and whether you're a buyer or a seller and farmers are both at various stages. And at you know, one time they're gonna be uh, pro big minimum lot sizes and at other sizes, other times they're gonna be against it. It's a really difficult issue, but it is one that needs focus um, because it will continue to lead to conflict unless there isn't some consistency uh, in there that's understood. Um, all of that's gotta be backed up by a legislated dispute resolution mechanism. Um, to manage conflict. So going back to that Ontario example, the Normal Farm Practices Protection Board, at the end of all of that, there is a legislated process. It works so well that you don't, 97% of the complaints are resolved before they get to that. Because in, in talking to people from Ontario and I, you know, trying to understand how that worked, they talked about the idea that, uh, you know, the fact that that's sitting there at the end of the day means that that we know we need to resolve it before it gets to that. So having that resolution, that legislative resolution practice there ready to go solves a lot of problems before they even get to it. Um, and just distribution of, of legislative consistent buffer zone requirements. Final slide, because uh, I know I've gone way over time here. Um, uh, some, some strategic responses, um, some proactive ones, around uh, all related to those uh, better education, um, better communication uh, around uh, what agriculture is, about understanding in the community about how agriculture works. Uh, and then some you know, more reactive ones uh, that are gonna need to be there because you know, none of this is, there's always gonna be issues. There's gonna need to be understood pathways to resolve conflict, um, and, uh, you know, 
hopefully minimise the impact of conflict once it does um, arise. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, apologies, I have gone fairly well over time. I hope I haven't taken uh, away too much of uh, Daryl's time. We will have time for Q&A at the end. And please, just a reminder, if you do have questions to uh, put them in the, in the chat function down, uh, in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Thanks, I'll hand over to Daryl. Oh, thanks, Richard. And uh, thanks, thanks, Katie. Uh, so I'm Daryl Quinlivan. I, I was appointed in August last year as the New South Wales Agriculture Commissioner. And uh, the Minister, Minister Marshall, gave me the initial task to review the state's right to farm policy and to look at the next tranche of um, the next tranche of uh, policy measures that might be included in a in, in the, the right to farm package. And so that's what we've been doing since August and uh, there's probably quite a number of participants in this webinar have been part of that process, including um, a series of webinars this week that we're doing on, on uh, possible, possible measures to include in that, uh, that next tranche. This is a global problem. Um, characteristics differ from place to place, but um, the, uh, the essential problem of competition for land and uh, competition for quality agricultural land. Uh, Daryl, you, sorry, oh. you muted yourself. You're right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The uh, the characteristics vary from place to place, but the essential problem of competition for land is is pretty well. A universal and although Australia has a, a low overall population density our population is focused on the coast and the coastal strip and of course that's where our most productive land um, has been um, so this is uh, uh, this is unresolved this is an unresolved issue pretty well everywhere some people doing it better than others um, uh, nobody is doing a perfect job here but land is the most valuable asset along with its people uh, in the state. And uh, the planning system designed to regulate that land use uh, is, a, is a major economic system and uh, very complex. It's developed over decades and uh, looking to improve it, change it, uh, you need to be very careful of unintended consequences. Uh, equally, if you could make beneficial changes, the long-term uh, returns can be very significant. So we're working our way through all that very carefully. Uh, some of the issues are economic, particularly uh, growth in, in, uh, in the rural economy, particularly, uh, particularly in the west of the divide. Um, others are more to do with what do we want the long-term uh, coastal strip and the Sydney Basin to look like. And, uh, Richard talked earlier about green belts in in uh, in the UK, and that's essentially a policy about preventing villages from merging through unconstrained urban development. And our issues along the coastal strip and in the Sydney Basin are essentially the same, really. But in 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 uh, deciding that you don't want unconstrained urban development, that you do want green zones and uh, agri production agriculture to be incurring in those areas. You can't do it in a ghetto either. People can't be locked into low value, um, low, low profitability uh, enterprises. They have to be viable um, if they're going to accept the trade-off for uh, lower, lower land values and uh, being, being laying locked in residential areas. And that is the reality uh, in a lot of areas. So, so we've got a lot of work to do to, to resolve all that. Um, we've, been, uh, we've been looking at the issues that Richard raised and some others um, uh, through, through the development of a strategy that has three broad themes. The first one is to do with the productive capacity of our agriculture industries. That's traditionally focused on land but uh, increasingly access to water, uh, transport links, connectivity, labor sources, reliable power and so on, are at least as important as land and in many cases more important. And so that makes the task of identifying um, 
uh, high value or, or indeed any land suitable for agricultural development uh, more difficult and necessarily more granular. Uh, but we do need to start with, a, with a, an effective means of identifying agricultural land if we're going to uh, regulate it more effectively. There's a lot, of, a lot of agreement on that. In fact, I think a pretty well universal consensus that we need to do uh, a better job of identifying our, our agricultural land if we're going to regulate it <coughs> more effectively. Uh, but there is no consensus beyond that. In fact, once you begin to talk about how to do that, um, uh, the difficulties emerge. And so we're, we're grappling with the complexities of that. I think, I think it is um, very clear that we will, uh, we will be recommending to the New South Wales government that there be a more comprehensive method, method for uh, identifying agricultural land, classifying it and applying appropriately regulatory regimes to, to that land. But the, um, the detail um, is complicated. I doubt we'll get it right, but um, it's important to start in a more effective way than we're currently doing that. Um, Richard talked about uh, the, the lack of evidence uh, in this area. And uh, that is a particular problem for us. We're making the most of what's available, uh, but we are relying quite a lot on, on the experiences of, um, of, uh, of uh, local government planners, uh, of uh, people engaged in production agriculture and professionals in this area, but it's not really systematic data. It's the not, not the kind of uh, evidence you would normally expect to have when you're contemplating uh, changes to such a significant economic system as land use planning. The second theme that we're looking at is uh, managing land use conflict more effectively and hopefully re reducing it. Uh, the underlying forces here are increasing its incidence and, and also uh, its implications. Uh, Richard talked about a number of um, a uh, number of models that are in place in Australia and around the world for doing this. There are two main issues. One is conflict over existing operations. Um, and it's clear that as urban development and, and normal, uh, uh, normal farming operations begin to intersect more sharply, uh, there are a number of problems that, that are emerging. Uh, ignorance, uh, failure to accept that semi-rural life is a, is a package deal um, and so on. Uh, so we're looking at all of the things that uh, Richard talked about from education through to arbitration as mechanisms to uh, uh, take the steam out of what looks to be an escalating problem. And uh, the sharp point of all this, as many of you probably know, is the north coast of New South Wales, uh, where there are real problems. But um, increasingly in the areas around our uh, major regional centres, um, these kind of things are starting to emerge uh, as well. But we don't know, uh, we don't have a, we don't have a, um, we don't have the data to put an economic cost on that, but uh, the, everybody thinks it's a big problem. Um, everybody engaged in this area uh, has lots of stories about it. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a reasonable presumption that it's a big problem and the cost is increasing, uh, even if we don't precisely know what it is. The next part of this issue is conflict over new and expanded operations. And uh, this is a really crucial issue, I think, because the development path for agriculture in Australia, and probably more so in New South Wales than Australia generally, is increased intensification, uh, whether it's horticulture, livestock production, uh, whatever it might be, um, it's clear that more and more investment, more and more production is going to come from uh, semi-intensive and intensive production systems. And they're exactly the kind of uh, uh, production systems that tend to um, arouse the, the conflict that we're, we're looking at here. Now, um, uh, there seem to be just too many good projects that we're hearing about that have not been able to proceed because, uh, well, mainly for two reasons. One is that there does seem to be uh, quite a lot of opportunities in the planning system for opponents of these projects to not stop them, but delay them, um, defer them, uh, 
uh, increase the cost of their development. And if you're contemplating a large scale um, greenhouse development or a feedlot or a piggery, whatever it might be, um, most of the proponents of these projects can invest in South Australia, Victoria, Southern Queensland, Victoria, they've got choices and um, there are quite a number of um, quite a number of stories that we've heard of people who've had good projects appeared to meet all of the the requirements that we have for uh, we would have for new investment uh, in in uh, in rural New South Wales and they've not able to, not been able to navigate the uh, the planning system through to completion successfully and they've just gone elsewhere um, and uh, we're testing whether that's because of characteristics in the New South Wales system, um, whether the investment climate uh, is different in some other states, um, whether the approach of local governments in other states uh, are more sympathetic to these kind of investments. But it's clear it's happening. Um, again, we don't know uh, how large the scale might be. And it's also clear this is a long-term problem. It's not something that's just arisen in the last few years. People talk about that some of these projects have been going on uh, for a long time and uh, they follow other projects that failed to get up uh, in New South Wales. And uh, it does seem that there are opportunities for pretty cynical use of loopholes in the system to, uh, uh, to delay uh, approval decisions. So uh, we're looking at those and looking for uh, advice to the government on how uh, we can improve the efficiency of the the decision making uh, and planning system in New South Wales for, for new projects. Uh, it's clear these things are really important. Uh, as I mentioned, that's the development path for agriculture in New South Wales, but it's also um, essential to the employment base in our regional towns. Most of these things would want to be located within reasonable traveling distance of a labor supply, and they'd improve the economic base and the economic resilience of our, our regional towns. And that's a really important policy objective as well. The third theme we're looking at is uh, opportunities for measures in the planning system, uh, which will stimulate growth uh, and support growth. There's a whole lot of different uh, issues here, most of them relatively small, but we think the cumulative impact of lots of small in this, measures in this area could be quite significant. They include things like uh, adjustments to land use def definitions for ancillary activities, um, a greater, uh, a longer and more extensive list of activities that are deemed to comply and, uh, and exempt from the, from the new planning requirements. Uh, more effective regulation of buffers. Richard talked about this, but um, it's a really crucial tool for, um, a structural tool for um, separating land use and minimizing land use conflict, but it's applied as guidelines. Um, so it's not applied rigorously. And in many cases, uh, when approvals are given uh, based on um, based on the use of buffers, uh, one or other party uh, to that transaction on one or other side of the buffer uh, can, can then chip away at that buffer and undermine the integrity of the, um, the original approval. That's clearly happening. Um, and so we're looking at, at measures that might um, uh, reinforce the, the influence and the enduring uh, significance of buffers. Um, um, there are other, um, other opportunities such as uh, the agent or initiator change principle to apply where um, new proponents are required to provide all the offset, offsets for buffers and so on so that the, the new proponent becomes responsible, if you like, for um, sterilising um, the problem with production agriculture rather than having to share that problem with the adjacent producer. Anyway, there is a vast array of these uh, that we're looking at and we're hoping that uh, we'll have a meaningful collection of those for the government to consider. Um, we're doing all this work now at, at this very moment. We, uh, we released just before Christmas, same time as the AFI report, um, a, uh, a draft or a final um, uh, review of our right to farm 
policy report, uh, but also an options paper for the next phase of policy measures. And we're consulting on that now. We're hoping to finish uh, that by the end of February and we've so the papers are out now for uh, public submissions. And uh, we'd welcome submissions from any of you who wanna follow this up and have a look at those, uh, those documents. Um, we'll be taking submissions through till the end of uh, February and meeting with people, large number of people through to the end of February. Uh, then we'll be spending uh, a month or two completing a report for the government. We're hoping to provide that report to the minister in about May. And uh, in the expectation, he'll then be able to um, take that package to his cabinet um, in the middle of the year. It's a lot of, uh, lot of issues, a lot of complexity, uh, not a great deal of data, um, a very large uh, number of anecdotes. Um, so it's a big job to try and make the judgment calls in amongst all that, the things that are gonna yield the biggest return for uh, policy change. But we think there's lots of opportunities for beneficial change as, as Richard mentioned, and we're happy to make the most of that over the next few months. So that's it for me. Happy to um, take some questions, Katie. Thank you, Daryl. Um, we'll just get Richard to rejoin us as well. We do have some questions there in the Q&A that Daryl and Richard hopefully are able to see. Um, just before we get into that, there is a comment to that I think we can address quickly from Ian about using a term other than right to farm that he's been working in this area for quite some time and finds that that can be quite a trigger word to use modern vernacular. What do you think about the term the right to farm versus something else like let the farmers farm or something similar? Daryl and Richard. Well, I, um, I think it is a, it's a, it's a difficult uh, term. I understand the political attachment to it. Uh, and I think it was originally uh, promoted by the New South Wales Farmers Association, but it, it can be a bit misleading because um, it doesn't it doesn't imply the creation of new rights, um, uh, nor the impairment of existing rights. What it really is aiming to do is to provide a regulatory climate that provides more confidence to uh, current and prospective uh, operators in the agriculture sector. Um, and that's an, it's an unamb unambiguously good thing if it's done in a if it's done in a, um, a reasonable way. So um, we're interpreting the right to farm in, in in that very practical way, and and perhaps over time as the as the um, further content in the policies develop, the the need for a, a term that that can arouse um, uh, adverse reactions might dissipate, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, yeah, agreed. Um, I guess I just point out that um, the term right to farm is understood globally in terms of particular approaches to policy and legislation. Um, you know, right to farm legislation is an area of law that exists all around the world um, and, and can be easily uh, sought and, and seen whether it applies, or whether it could apply in a, in a different jurisdiction. But, you know, agreed, uh, it, it's one thing just to describe a body of law as, as right to farm legislation. It, it's totally another thing to whether that's still appropriate language in terms of that communication and community interaction that I talked about, you know, a lot in, in being so important. Um, the language is really important in, in how we talk about that. And I agree right to farm is not the best. Um, I'm not particularly sure that let the farmers farm is either, um, to be honest, um, but I don't know what the right language is yet. It's something that we need to keep working on. We've got a question here from Byron that sort of follows on from a little from that language mm -hmm. question, but a little bit more detailed than that on S cell and B cell, stakes of dignity in ag land and biophysical agricultural land, that these should not be the only focus. Um, for example, intensive livestock production doesn't yep. require or rely on rely or require um, B cell, but is a major source of conflict. How will these industries be catered for in this framework, Daryl? I think I've already uh, addressed that. Um, um, I agree entirely. Uh, I mentioned the even more, uh, even clearer example of a, a protected agriculture where uh, land is the least, least um, important um, uh, need for a successful operation. So we are, we are looking at 
those things. Um, what we've got to try and do is uh, look at it on a statewide basis. So it's necessarily got some macro characteristics, but um, when you uh, take into account the, 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 the particular uh, issues that I listed, access to water, power, connectivity, labour source and so on, obviously that's getting pretty local and granular. So we've got to find a way of accommodating uh, all of that. And, uh, and then in considering what kind of controls uh, might be applied on development in those relevant areas. Also, there's got to be uh, both some, um, uniform, some uniformity or consistency on a statewide base, basis, but also allowing for um, uh, local, uh, local conditions and local needs and so on. So yeah, it's quite a, quite a difficult task. And we've had um, quite a lot of time with um, local government planners uh, discussing this, and as I mentioned um, earlier, everyone agrees it's an important thing to do. Um, and it, but it's clear that that the use of maps and the use of a set of decision-making principles, um, uh, none of them are without problems, and none of them will provide uh, a perfect solution. And um, if you if you provide local governments with a lot of discretion, how they uh, apply those things in their own jurisdiction, you'll find a lot of different approaches. So we're still looking looking at that. Uh, I think it's, it is an essential thing to do, um, but it is, it is very difficult to work out how to do it in the most effective, most cost effective way that captures both the statewide and the local, um, local characteristics. So um, watch this space is all I can say at the moment. Um, I might just make a point that uh, inevitably it was intensive conflict around intensive animal um, agriculture that was the most directly related to lack of understanding about the practice that was being proposed. Um, and that stems from um, perceptions of or experience of previous practice. And I think this is a really important thing to raise um, that People, you know, there, there was a particular case that we looked at um, where there was community objection to a new piggery development. Um, and it was an area where there had been some piggeries previously, some years ago, that were uh, very old management practice and, and frankly, pretty ordinary, you know, not, not very good, pretty smelly, pretty horrible. And the community, um, memory of that was what they were applying to and you know assuming that this new development was going to be like so the proponents basically took it upon themselves to put on a bus trip to take all the concerned local residents to see a modern piggery with all the best practice and everything that they were proposing and it completely changed the perception um, of the of the development and so that whole idea of understanding and, and you know what new practice is going to be but it also raises the point and and this is one you know that it might be a bit controversial um, but I think is really important to know and why I sort of you know said let the farmers farm concept is not particularly great either I don't think some farming practice is not acceptable you know farming practice evolves and it gets better and this, that should be a process that is embraced by the farming community as part of the social licence journey, as part of the being a good citizen in the community. As practices get better, they should be adopted that have less impact on the community. Now, that's part of this education story. That's part of this communication story. But it shouldn't, you know, it, it shouldn't just be assumed that any practice is OK. It, it's not. There's a question in the Q&A that also relates to a comment here in the chat. I'll just try and uh, bundle them up together if I can. The question is about whether application of current zoning objectives would not resolve many of these issues. For example, if RU1 land was set aside for primary production rather than land in waiting for development as currently is the case. And another, the comment was, um, are additional land use zone categories and standard map layers within the standard instrument LEP also being sought as SEPs are not the only option? Um, I know this is getting quite deeply into some of those planning questions, but would you like to comment on those as well? 
Yeah, well, I'll just stick to a conceptual level here. So what we're trying to do is identify land that is uh, an existing or prospective uh, agricultural use and has particular characteristics that make it uh, particularly attractive. And, um, and then thinking about what are the appropriate um, uh, land use controls um, that, that should be applied. So I don't think, I mean, some people would like to see that land um, set aside for uh, agricultural production uh, forever. Um, in other words, effectively uh, banning uh, material land use change. And in some cases that might be quite relevant. In fact, perversely, that might be uh, the best instrument to use in the coastal zone where for other reasons you are trying to preserve uh, a mixed land use uh, landscape. Um, and you're not really trying to promote agricultural activity, you're trying to uh, inhibit the uncontrolled development of, of, uh, of urban development. So uh, that's what we're trying to do and then think about what's the best way of, um, what's the best way of, of implementing the appropriate level of uh, land use controls. And there's a whole variety of instruments that are in place potentially could be applied and there's some new ones as well that we're, we're looking at. But at the moment, it's essentially a conceptual exercise and um, the most fundamental problem really is not working out um, how to regulate this land use it's how to identify it um, in a way that is um, on the one hand uh, very precise in that people know you know what the rules are that uh, apply or could potentially apply to their land but doesn't then take you straight into uh, difficulties that arise with, you know, properties on one side of a road and with one set of rules and properties on the other side of the, side of the road with a different set of rules, which affect asset values. So um, there's it's quite a, I mean, it's a very difficult task in practice, even though the essential concepts are, are relatively straightforward. So that's what we're, that's what we're exploring at present. Yeah, we are running very fast out of time. We still have a few questions left there. Um, one here from Jay, which is when market forces trigger land use change, for example, solar farms or mining, is there an established process or legislation to look into the economic, social and environment impact at a regional level? I think the short answer is yes, but if you'd like to expand a little bit on that, it would probably be helpful. Well, there is, but there's a lot of discretion and um, it depends a lot, the treatment of those projects, not so much mines, which can trigger, can be sufficiently large to trigger uh, processes like the Independent Planning Commission and so on, but um, for smaller developments that don't hit those thresholds, um, there's a lot of uh, heavy reliance on the judgments of local councils. And of course, local councils vary a lot. They vary a lot in their capacity um, they vary a lot in their, um, in their uh, uh, focus and interest on, on agriculture as against other land uses. Um, but they're all trying to grow. They're all trying to, nearly all trying to grow, grow their populations, uh, grow their economic base, um, prove the resilience of the, the, the local economies and the communities. And they're all, you know, good objectives. And a broader, a broader range of land uses uh, can definitely help that. Um, whether it be mines or, um, or energy uh, generating facilities, but there are trade-offs. And um, we, think, we do think there needs to be a bit more consistency across the state in how local governments approach these things, how they exercise their discretions. And also we think um, they do need a bit more help, the state government um, it would be well advised to provide uh, a bit more in the way of tools and decision-making instruments to help local government uh, manage these things. Many local governments feel very confident uh, and competent in dealing with these things, but a lot don't, a lot, you know, they don't deal with these kind of things very often. And when they do, they're, they're a novel experience and uh, they're not well set up to deal with novel experiences and um, often proponents that have got deep pockets and large legal budgets. Um, so we do think there is there's scope for uh, the state government to provide uh, a set of arrangements that, that, that um, provide local governments with a greater capacity and therefore a greater likelihood that we're going to get more consistent, high quality decisions across the state. Yeah, 
I think that fairly well addresses a comment there from John, which has come up in the chat and the Q&A as well, um, just talking about farmers' rights seeming to be less important than mining. Uh, Richard, you might just want to briefly talk about uh, your experience as you travelled to the, the northwest and spoke to quite a few people about this particular issue as well. It was the biggest factor that was fracturing the community up there was just that um, feeling of helplessness, essentially, uh, in the imbalance of power. Uh, that the farming community felt in the way that they were, they were able to participate in the planning process and, and conflict resolution. Um, they just felt that they were at an immediate disadvantage and, and starting um, on the back foot. And that the way that built up, and just, just very briefly, because I know we're out of time uh, to add to the previous point, the cumulative impact of all of that. So, you know, um, there might be a process to uh, assess the, the economic impact of a development application, but what happens when there's another one the next year, another one the next year, another one the next year, and all in the same area, and the cumulative impact of all of that starts to have a really significant impact on the region. There's not so much of a process around how that is assessed, um, and, and that's a big issue uh, as well. We are out of time, but the questions are pouring in right here at the end. If I can just uh, beg your indulgence for just a couple more minutes, I would like to finish with one here from Bev, which is taking more of a long-term view. And at the AFI, we're always banging on about how short-termism is, is undermining a whole lot of good decisions. Um, so if we could just wrap up on this one. Working with climate change mitigation ideas, e.g. looking after um, soil and water and water security in drought for long-term future. How intertwined is ag policy and planning with this essential conversation? You, you say the hardest question to last. Uh, not much is the answer. It, it's, it's, a, it's a wicked problem, isn't it? Um, thinking about uh, those very long-term issues and how we, you know, it, it um, the, the solar farm example is a great idea that, you know, that those huge solar farms and uh, the way that they're having, they're part of the um, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation story, which is having a positive long-term impact on agriculture. Um, that is not part of the planning process uh, in terms of, of whether they should go ahead. And again, particularly the cumulative impact of, of that that's having on a region. Um, Good it probably how you get that into the process is is really difficult. I don't know Daryl might have a bit more insight into it than I I, I can other than saying it's difficult. Uh, well, clearly I think the whole you know as a whole community we've got we've got a lot of work to do in this area and it's going to take a long time. And uh, I think the difficulty for the agriculture sector is that they're on the sharp end of the negative consequences. Uh, of all this, you know, it's the last 20 years, if you, re if you reflect on our experience over the last 20 years and think, well, that's what the future is going to look like, maybe probably even uh, warmer and drier, um, you know, it's been a very difficult period for uh, agricultural production and we've approached extreme water shortages uh, at least twice, uh, depending on where you are, uh, over that period, in some cases more than twice. Um, a lot of investment's gone into improving the resilience of those water supplies. I think needs to be a lot more, particularly linking up um, water systems. Um, producers themselves, particularly dry land producers, I think have you know, made enormous strides in the last uh, couple of decades in dealing with a, a warmer, drier, drier climate. And the, the crop yields that we're getting in dry years now are a testament to that fact. So I think, you know, parts of our system are, are responding uh, brilliantly. Uh, they're adapting, they're making investments uh, to adjust to changing circumstances. Um, but as, as a community, we're, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, no doubt. Thank you. Uh, we are well and truly over time and I'm very sorry we didn't get to get to everybody's questions. We will be putting a recording of this webinar up on uh, the AFI's website on that page that I linked to earlier in the chat. And we'll also put links in there, cross links back to the DPI's options paper and surveys so that you've got all the information you need and feel free to share those widely around.
Um, thanks for joining us today very much. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Richard, for your time. And we will have to leave it there. Thank you. Thanks.